2020. All right, we've also had the implementation of the Building Act, which took effect in January 2020. To support, the, to support this Act, three main boards have been um, that are in place and are functional, which include the Building Appeals Tribunal, the Building Practitioners Board, and also the Building Advisory Board. All right, and in the process too, we've been doing extensive work. We've been we've drafted some regulations, and we're all, we also continue to draft um, to work and, and review regulations to support the Building Act. Thank you very much for your time. There ends my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Byron. The National Solid Waste Management Authority, of course, has a critical role in making Jamaica a more beautiful place. And so without further ado, I call on the Executive Director, Mr. Audi Gordon, to address you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. This Christmas season comes at the back end of three months of unprecedented rains in our country, which has significantly set back our operations, both in terms of our delivery time and uh, the way we turn around trucks at our disposal facility. Consequently, we developed uh, quite a, a few backlogs in many communities across Jamaica. We are happy to report now that we have cleared upward of 60% of those backlogs. And so we are now in a part where we can see the clean Christmas that Jamaicans so desire and in fact deserve. We have extended operating hours at our disposal facility primarily because it's not just about taking up the garbage, it's where you put it, how you store it. And there's no point having the truck spilled and can't empty. So we have chosen at this time to extend the opening hours at the disposal facility. We have a partnership with the Jamaica Constabulary Force to give us that extra security coverage we need as we work deep into the night and in fact, some, in some instances, like the Riverton, round the clock. We also put in place verbal agreements with heavy duty operators. We can't afford not to have a piece of equipment working at any of the disposal sites. So should a unit go down for whatever reason, we have in place an agreement where we can overnight, in a minute, we can call an, an operator and get a replacement in so that we have a smooth flow throughout the holiday seasons. We are also adding 50 plus tipper trucks and they are, some of them have started working already and we will increase that in two days time with the operations that will start in and around the town centers. Over 50 tipper trucks will be added to our regular supplementary fleet to help us to further the cause of that clean Christmas. Again, I say that the people not only desire but fully deserve. We have a big operation coming beginning this Thursday where we will focus a lot of attention around the Kingston and St. Andrew Market District. That's the main district downtown. Also the Charles Garden Market uh, in Montego Bay. These are historically problematic at Christmas time. Um, they are challenging in regular times let alone at Christmas. And what we'll be doing, we'll be having additional trucks in those space, additional sweepers. We have already looked at adding over 400 sweepers for the Christmas holiday. Now, why is this significant? It is significant because the people, the amount of people that go into our town centers at Christmas I am sometimes wondering if we have the population numbers right. Because at Christmas, everybody is out. And they do quite a bit of littering, unfortunately. So the town centers are a mess at the close of play. We have ensured that we put in the requisite numbers of sweepers right across Jamaica to treat with 
that excess garbage that we will encounter and ensure that we are in there after the sh last shuffle and then we are out of there before the first shuffle. So the following morning you will show up to a clean town center and by your two with it in the day, we'll be back behind you to clean up for the following day. And so with the additional measures that we're putting in, with the additional trucks, the additional sweepers, we should achieve the clean Christmas. Again, I say that the people is um, deserving of. We want to also make mention here of the enhanced dengue mitigation program that we are giving full support working with the Ministry of Health. And so far, we have gone into communities uh, 320 districts already. And we have removed over 500 loads of bulky waste. And this is significant because we have a duty at the NSWMA to ensure that we rid the community of the excess um, um, garbage and the bulky waste is a critical component of that. And we have done quite a decent job in the first phase of our enhanced dengue mitigation program. All of this would be to naught if we don't have the full participation of our fellow brothers and sisters out in Jamaica. Personal responsibility, therefore, have to be part of the conversation. And we are here appealing that we take responsibility for the solid waste that we generate. It is not sufficient to just leave it to the NSWMA, the councillor, or the member of parliament. It's important that all of us know that we have a duty to ensure Jamaica's beauty. In local government month, November, we launch the My Waste, My Responsibility campaign. We also launch a campaign called Solid, stamping out littering and illegal dumping. In the new year, you will hear a lot more about that. But for now, I am asking that we use the opportunity, not because it's Christmas, to containerize our garbage, to keep it in a safe and secure space until the truck arrives. It is a duty that we have at source. We also want to emphasize continued regard being given to the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And we have since added composting. So reduce, reuse, recycle, and composting. Reduce the number of gift items with bulky packaging this Christmas. We are asking you to do that. We don't have to give a lot of gift paper and all the different boxes and things. We can just use a gift bag for some of the gifts and then we can reuse the gift bag and so on. And we do this not just to save my disposal facilities um, from the excess, but it's also good for the environment when we do this. Recycling. Take out the plastic bottles, put them in a separate um, garbage bag, and you can call Recycling Partners of Jamaica, and they will come um, um, for it. And then composting. We have now um, uh, started um, putting together the partnership between SDC and RADA, where we'll go into every household across Jamaica if needs be, the schools, the churches, everybody, to talk composting. Why? Over 70% of what we currently take to a disposal site Based on our latest garbage characterization survey, over 70% is compostable. We don't need to be carrying such a valuable material to dump off somewhere when it has such good commercial value and is very good soil nutrients. So we want to push that conversation um, also. Our community relations officers are always willing to meet with you. Give them a call at 876-448-3220. That's 876-448. 448-3220. We are also in the embryonic stages, as I said earlier, of a partnership that will see us more visible. We want your full cooperation when we come. Always bear in mind that Jamaica's beauty remains our collective duty. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. The work of the Jamaica Fire Brigade goes way beyond the extinguishing of fires and responding to fire calls. And now at this time, I will ask the commissioner, Mr. Stuart Beckford, to tell you a bit about what will be happening this Christmas, as well as the GFE's performance over 2019. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so before I get into talking about what we as citizens need to do to enjoy a safe and fire-free Christmas, I want to give you a brief account of what has happened across Jamaica this year. As you are aware, the Jamaica Fire Brigade is involved in responding to motor vehicle accidents on our roadways. And I think we are seeing too many of that um, these days. So for example, for this year, we would have responded to approximately 946 motor vehicle accidents across Jamaica. And this is a 12% increase over the 846 that we had in 2018. And what we are seeing, ladies and gentlemen, is that these scenes are getting more gory than previous scenes. A um, person seems to be driving a lot faster. I'm not sure if it's because of the new highways, but the speeds that we are seeing on the road, you know, is, is resulting in some of these accidents. I'm imploring motorists to take it easy on our highways and byways this Christmas season. Fire cars. Um, since January, between January and November, we would have responded to 12,881 fire calls. And this is 798 more than we would have responded to in 2018. Sorry, an increase of about 7%. And a lot of this is due to the extended drought that we would have experienced between January and um, September of this year. So we'd have seen an increase in our call count for bushfires. In terms of fires affecting houses, business places, and other structures, um, we have seen a 1% increase um, over the, the figures that we had for January and November of 2018. So the figures for this particular um, type of fires have remained flat. In, in each year, though, there were, um, there were far more house fires than, biz than business fires. And for this year, we would have responded to just over 1,088 um, house fires. And this compared to 324 commercial fires. Uh, we remain very concerned about our citizens who have been killed because of these fires. And while we, have, we would have seen a 19% decrease in, this, in the figure for this year, the fact remains that 30 persons would have been killed in fires, 24 adults and 6 children. So there has been a 41% decrease in the number of fire-related deaths so far, and there has been, uh, for this year, we would have had 54 persons who would have been injured in fires as opposed to 91 in 2018. This year, 2,082 people would have lost their houses through fires, which reflect a marginal increase of 1% over the 2,060 we, we, we experienced in 2018. When everything is considered, we cannot appeal enough to you to do everything to ensure your personal safety. Personal responsibility is critical to staying alive during the upcoming holidays and beyond. There will be parties at different venues all over the island. We ask that you be very, you be aware of the buildings you go into to have a good time. The fire brigade inspects among other buildings, places of amusement, and we have examined 1,019 of these facilities between January and November of this year. Of this amount, we were able to certify one of 140 as fit for use. So the vast majority of these are uncertified. And some of the bridges that we would have observed uh, when we do our inspections are one, 
Some of these places operate without fire alarms, which, is, which are critical. Smoke and heat detectors and exit and emergency lit signs. There was no alternative exit, whether it's on the ground floor or upper floor at some of these facilities. In some cases, the alternate exit were blocked. There were no fire extinguishers. There were no signs stating the maximum number of people the building can hold at one time. So by way of example, there are 308 recorded places of amusement in Kingston and St. Andrew. 38 of these 308 are certified, while the remaining 270 are not. This means that 88% of, of these places are not certified. St. Catherine has 215 places of am amusement and record, of which only 14 are certified. This means that 93% of these venues are 200 on one such places are not certified. St. James, another of one of our big parishes, has 109 such places, of which 49 are certified. Remaining 60 venues, or 55%, are not certified. And this gives cause for concern. We are very, very concerned about um, the level of approval that currently exists for our entertainment facilities. So the period, we want you to remain safe. And as such, we will be giving you some critical safety advice during the festive period. And so, for example, we are asking that persons who, um, as one of their favorite pastimes, continue to put up um, Christmas lights, we ask that when you go to bed, you ensure that these lights are um, unplugged. We ask that you never leave cooking unattended. We are seeing too many fires being caused from persons leaving cooking unattended. Make sure that your electrical appliances and extension cards are UL rated. Throw away paper lights that are worn and broken. Talk with family members about the fastest way to get out of your house. And here I want to encourage persons to practice your fire drill. It can make the difference between you being alive and you perishing in a fire. It's critical that you do this not just in the day, but also at night. We, ask, we also recommend that if your home or business was wired more than five years ago, that you have it checked by a certified electrician to ensure that your wiring are still in good working condition. The issue of fireworks, I'm sure, will, take, um, will be prom uh, prominent throughout the Christmas period going into the new year. We want to advise the public that fireworks displays are illegal without the requisite permit. And for you to obtain a permit, we're asking that, one, you provide certain basic information, such as you provide a transportation plan showing how the fireworks will be moved to the proposed display area. We're also asking that the vehicle that is being used to transport the fireworks must be this must have displayed the relevant hazard placards or labels. The applicant must provide starting and end times for the fireworks display and must provide an emergency plan should there need for persons to leave the venue in a hurry. The fireworks display, if approved, must be done by licensed persons and must take place at an approved location, far away from buildings, crowded areas, or flammable materials. Let me assure the public that the Jamaica Fire Brigade is ready to handle any emergency that may arise during the holiday season. However, with your help and cooperation, I believe we can experience an incident-free, fire-free Christmas. I thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. The local authorities have a critical role to play in the regulation of business and residential activities in their jurisdictions. And so it is in that context that I will now call on His Worship, the Mayor of Kingston and St. Andrew, Councillor Delroy Williams, to address you.
Minister, Honorable Minister, Heads of Agency, Chairman of the NSWMA, Executive Director of the NSWMA, other PS, PS, oh, <laughs> Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Local Government and Community Development, members of other agencies, I'm seeing Fire, fire Brigade, and other agencies. Good morning. Well, this afternoon <laughs> has been a tough morning. The, the issue of permits and the noise abatement, the extension in terms of events. Uh, there are several issues, not a, it's a, even though a very kind of controversial issue, but not as bad as we think. For firstly, for us, Minister, all the information we have thus far, Tone Clark, is that we have been experiencing a significant decline in applications for entertainment, for, uh, for permits, for events, for the December period. So most persons would say to you that, well, we have opened the floodgate and you know, it's going to be events after events. Really, those events, that, that is not what we're experiencing at the municipality. I can't, I can't speak for St. Catherine, but for Kingston, we have seen a significant decline in the applications for, for amusement license, and which is of some concern to us at the municipality. But for those who would argue that the the extension of the time, you know, that it would, I mean, residents can be concerned, but in terms of what, it, what is actually occurring, in terms of the number of events, the number of events for the December period, uh, we have seen it. And we, it can, it ex, we can explain it because the, the extension would have been late. The climate coming up to the December season would have been, the environment would have been that promoters were a little concerned as to what was happening. So a lot of persons who would have promoted events in the period, a lot of them, the information we are getting is that a lot of them would have decided not to have some events. Which is important for us, it's, which, which we, it's important also that we send the message of it's important and it's what the government is working towards, that we create an environment that encourages business and the inter entertainment industry is a critical part of government and not putting unnecessary. I would say that there's one thing that is a fact that we have to 50s, 60s, and it evolved with open air activities, what we call dances on a lawn. And that's how the music, the dance hall, the reggae, and then the dance hall evolved. And that's part of how we as Jamaicans, as Kingstonians, experience a party. It, it's a, a lot of our parties are open air parties. And, but we don't have a lot of venues that are removed from residential areas. So that, that is just what we are faced with within the city of Kingston. It's a creative city of music. Music is a major feature of the character of the city. We can't escape that. We are known internationally for our music. It was reggae. The recent articles showing you now that dancehall is, is now a major type of music, genre of music on the international scene. So even though in back some years ago we were just Reggae would be what we would say that is dominating the international scene in terms of the types of music coming out of Jamaica. Now we are seeing that dancehall is, is, is putting its mark as a genre of music on the international scene. And so as this creative city of music and as a city that people look for for certain types of entertainment, we have to find a sustainable solution not just a solution, but a solution that is sustainable, that takes all of this into consideration, which is that we don't have venues at our fingertips. Our venues are mixed into residential areas. 
So if you go across many of the inner city communities, the areas that they have their parties are just really mixed into the, where people live. And if you get outside and come out into more established venues, like you know, your mass camp and your gardens and the different venues, you still have the same, the Constant Spring Golf Club, you still have the same problem, that they are adjacent, very close to residential communities. And so it's, it, it creates a confrontational challenge. I don't know if that's a proper term. And so as the mayor of the city, I'm not just dealing with the residents. So if I go to a meeting of residents, I'm going to just be hearing one thing primarily. And you know, you're going to be battered for allowing certain types, for, for allowing the event. But then if you go to a meeting of promoters, then you are battered again as the mayor for not considering the importance of music and of the culture to the city. And so, what do you do as the mayor of the city? Then you have to have, you have to understand all the issues. So you have to make yourself acquainted with the issues. We can't say that people must, the people have to live and enjoy the peace of their own and the comfort. At the same time, that we, we have this music that is, that, that is, a part of who we are as a people. And it's, it's, the, it's the culture that we have to preserve. And the Prime Minister said something which is very important, that in preserving the culture, we have to give order to, the, to, to what is happening. So, so it, just allowing anything to happen and allowing people to just go anywhere they want, play anything they want, any time of night they want, that is a recipe for the destruction of the culture or the denigration. So, so that's not the route we are going. So the route that we have to take is to bring everything in balance. And that is the challenge of government. How do you bring everything into balance? How do you create the structure of order? Which means that we have to give and take. And I'm wrapping up. I know I'm here too long. But we have to give the, 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 the real message we're sending now. Have we found the sustainable solution? I would say no. We haven't found it as yet. Are we pursuing it? Yes, we are pursuing it. And we have to pursue it by getting all the players on board. I personally would recommend, I mean, I would say to the Minister of, of Entertainment, that we need really a music advisory board. And this is what I will end on. You need a board that can pull all the, the stakeholders together so that the, all the different issues are put together and, that, and so decisions can be made and that all the players and the stakeholders understand why the decisions are made and understand why you have to have give and take and why you have to have compromise. And because there is no way we are going to find a sustainable solution without compromise. So if we're going to keep the culture and maintain the culture and understand its, its importance to us as a people, to how we are viewed as a people, and to the economy in terms of business opportunities and employment generation, then we have to understand that there must be compromise. But then the compromise that we make must, must have at the end of the day, the quality of life that we live within the city must be high. And I would say that if we, can't, if we don't bring order to the industry and order to events and, and their promotion, then we're not going to have the structure of order and it's going to, 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 to impact the quality of life. And so I would say for us to pursue, I see the town clerk in there, I know the minister wants us to finish it, it's something the, so I would say the noise abatement for us, Minister, is that even though the residents are concerned, for us, we, are, we really do. Last year, we have over 700 events in December. Uh, we, we're not anywhere near that. So I, for residents, to me, it would be better for them, for this December period, if you just look at the data, than last year. Legal events, than last year. Approved events. 
And uh, so I would say the data suggests otherwise. That this December is, should be far easier on the residents of the, the municipalities than last year. And But I would say to the residents that let's pursue this sustainable solution into the new year. Let's find a solution that encourages the industry, that creates an environment for the industry to flourish. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. It's important for the municipality. So let's find the solution that all of us can accept. And we don't have the solution as yet. Let, let us pursue it. Let us all work together and pursue it. And I'm sure if we put all our heads together in a reasonable way, we will find the solution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayor. I will immediately call on your counterpart, His Worship, the Mayor of Spanish Town, Councillor Norman Scott, to bring remarks. Thank you very much, um, Oliver, Honorable Minister, heads of various agencies, um, Executive Director, Permanent Secretary, media personalities, of course, my colleague and host, Mayor, members of the Ministry of Local Government, and of course, my own CEO. I'm going to start from where um, Mayor Williams left off. He didn't make any recommendation. He was just throwing the thing out in the air. I want to make a recommendation, minister, um, minister and colleague, that, and I concur with you, um, Feda, that the industry is a multi-billion industry and it requires collaboration, consultation, and you call it give and take. Um, being that we are the closest to the people, I would recommend, Minister, that, and I know that the police, they are not here today, but they have authority as it relates to the noise abatement but we give permits and we give licenses it would be incumbent on government to set up a committee local authorities promoters Citizens Association because they respond to their own communities. We as local authorities, our local government practitioners, we are also close to the people. The police, and we have a joint team. So for every event that has controversy, um, Mayor Williams, then that committee would be able to look at what is happening, and to come to a compromise. Um, of course, you will have established venues um, where there ain't going to be any need for compromise because those venues are already established venues. And so on that part, we will and should be able to have a win-win situation because I know for sure um, there are some communities in Spanish town I get the calls every week and although there is a SOE those people still find a way to play their loud music and creating new senses to the communities and that's as far as my own recommendation. I want to use the opportunity to commend 
and even though it is late in the day, um, the extended period granted to um, persons, promoters, um, small round robin peepers, those people who really their livelihood and further again, um, St. Catherine, like the KSAMC, has seen a significant decline in the numbers of requests for entertainment um, for the well for the year and for the period here. Um, <clears throat> I hope that those persons who still wanted to keep their their entertainment um, activities ensure that they request the various permits they follow the law because whilst there's going to be this extended period it doesn't mean that it is going to be a free for all I am going to lead the municipalities to ensure that all activities within St. Catherine that the requisite permits are received failure to do that will mean that the police and the team from the municipalities is going to close those activities down if they don't get the requisite permits. I also want to use the opportunity to um, say to the promoters that in advertising your promotions, your various activities, you are again being asked to follow the law and to get the various um, permit licenses and authorities to go out and put up your billboards, um, paste up your posters, and not to use the public spaces, for example, bus stops and all of those places where you see have now filled up with all kinds of um, promotional activities. It is against the law, and um, my good friend, oddly, has trained some of our municipal officers, and we will be collaborating with them to ensure that the law is followed. The public is also being advised of changes that have taken place for the allowance of the festive season and this as it relates to the market districts. St. Catherine has three major market districts, Linstead, Spanish Town, Old Arbor and to a lesser extent Bogwa. The opening hours have been extended for the market districts and um, I'm going to be just giving a quick announcement as it relates to some streets that have been given to the vendors and, you, and I, I think it was my colleague who mentioned or it was one of those speakers before that they don't think that they statistics as it relates to the number of persons living in Jamaica is ever correct because just vending alone the numbers of persons that you see come out to do vending have increased exponentially and um, because of that the regular market areas can't hold the amount of persons that want to vend so we have taken a the opportunity to extend um, areas for vending and for Spanish Town we have given two streets and we are making these two streets pedestrian only during the period 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. in the daytime and these streets are Old Market Street the intersection of Cumberland Road and Young Street 
Beckford Street, by Wellington Street, to Old Market Street. These two streets have been given as pedestrian only. Uh, other market area in Spanish Town includes Burke Road on the southern side of the road has been allowed for vending. So uh, persons can still traverse these areas except those two that I mentioned will be made pedestrian only during the hours 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. For Linstead, uh, Fletcher's Avenue, that has been given for um, vending. Yeah. Vendors are asked to ensure that vehicle traffic can pass through. Old Arbor, we have given uh, one street in Old Arbor and also in Bog Walk. Just want to uh, advise that the municipal officers of the St. Catherine Municipal Corporation will be out in their numbers and they will be monitoring traffic in the major townships. And of course, you all know that the signs have been posted, no parking, no stopping, and all of these will be observed. Um, by the municipal officers. And last but not least, I want to announce that Job Lane has been reopened after being closed due to the um, rain, heavy rains in September, where a section of the road was broken. It has now been reopened, and this has eased traffic congestion tremendously in the Spanish town and its surroundings. Area. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mayor Scott. Ladies and gentlemen, earlier you heard from the Executive Director of the National Solid Waste Management Authority. And now I would like to call on the Chairman of the Authority, Mr. Dennis Strong, to bring remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me recognize my minister as the best performing minister. Right, minister? <laughs> um, my executive director, the most effective one in the public sector. I don't care who I'm vex. Right? My permanent secretary, right? Most effective permanent secretary. <laughs> and the fire chief. Um, I want to also recognize my board member, the mayor who, because he came to NSO, we made, made him mayor after that, so. <laughs> um, but good afternoon, everyone. Let, let me just quickly go over some of the achievements we had in 2019, which we think were significant. And let me start by saying that when our board sat down, what, we, we, we don't have any big objectives or roles. One of the primary roles that we had that guided us to doing everything is that we said that we must make our minister look good. And we hope that we have achieved that. So based on that, we have set up, we set up a corporate governance policy framework. But in 2019, we had three major objectives. The first one was to get updated audited financial statements, which are nine years behind. And we are fully up to date now with unqualified statements for all five entities and we submitted on time and I think we at the Corporate Governance Awards we were the only one oddly who had who had tabled thanks to our minister in Parliament. Um, so we're up to date there and we are making plans for the year coming up. We also had the objective of well let me speak with that one last but we, we also had the objective of garbage collection through getting a significant amount of garbage trucks in the system. Thanks to our minister, we've had over the past two years, 43 new trucks added to the fleet. And it's not because of the lack of trucks where we can't collect garbage, it's rain and traffic and that sort of thing. So 
I recommend it to the minister that he take over in WA. <laughs> so I think, I think that's in the works. So by next month or so, we'll have that one sorted out too. Right? And next year, <laughs> next year we're supposed to get another 100 trucks in the system. The first ever, right, in the history of NSO that we're getting so many trucks over a short period of time. So that takes care of the second objective that we have. I'll go to the third one finally and last, but just to speak about some other things, we had the objective of dealing with the disposal, right? And risk mitigation there, because we use a risk management framework to manage our operations. For the first time in the history of NSWMA, we have three of the eight sites having environmental permit, <laughs> including the two biggest ones which is Riverton and Retirement. Um, we have new regulations coming soon, so if you don't dispose of your garbage properly, then you might find that you lose your house, right? Or something like that. But <laughs> not so bad, but, but the fines are significant. So we, we're looking at those, and thanks to the PS for, for pushing it through for us. We also have We've worked on our, our policies internally, and we're, we're now putting in place a whistleblower policy, which we're hoping to effect early in 2020, um, so that our employees can call an independent uh, place and report anything that they think is, is wrong within the organization. And secondly, we're putting in place a sexual harassment policy, which is in train, and Minister, the, the, the ED told us that he needed protection, so we put <laughs> we're putting that policy in place for him. So, yeah, yeah apparently there's a problem down there. Right, Kimberly? <laughs> but I just want to end by saying that because of all of these things that we have done, Minister, we entered the Public Sector Corporate Governance Awards function for the first time, which is put on by the Ministry of Finance and the PSOJ, and we walked away with a special recognition certificate for significant improvement in corporate governance practices at the authority, and also first runner-up in compliance and disclosure in the information category. And, and this, we think, Minister, is significant because four years ago this was seen as one of the most corrupt organizations. So, Minister, that is our 2019 report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. The Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management has an unquestionably critical role in the improvement of Jamaica's disaster risk management profile. And at this time, I'm going to ask the Director of Information and Training, Ms. Delmaris White, to bring remarks. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, following my counterpart, um, I will not be as jovial and funny, but I assure you that we're here to support the ministry in all that it does. So my task here this afternoon is to just give you an update in terms of what the ODPEM has been doing and what it is we intend to do to support our partners who have presented here this morning. And so I start off by just reminding you that it's December and we reflect on the year ending. We would like to highlight some of the achievements of the ODPEM and offer some insights on our planned work as we look to 2020 with promise and excitement. Yes, we're excited because at the ODPEM, we want to, in 2020, expand the business continuity training for small and medium enterprises. We want to launch a public information and education campaign for the Disaster Risk Management Act of 2015. And additionally, we want to support our partners, the Fire Brigade, in reducing the risk from fires and the Health Ministry of Health in the dengue outbreak and other natural and man-made hazards that have been impacting our country. The OTPEM, in collaboration with the United Nations Development Program, conducted business continuity planning training for small and medium enterprises in 2018. The training was held island-wide, and more than 200 persons were trained in how to get their businesses back up and running 
after disaster or an emergency. Participants included chefs, cosmetologists, mechanics, store owners, barbers, and other artisans. Micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises have been important drivers of equity, economic growth, and sustainable development in Jamaica. These enterprises create and retain wealth generate employment and provide support for private sector growth and expansion. So the business continuity planning training will be expanded in 2020 when we will collaborate with the municipal corporations and have an additional 200 persons trained across the island who will be trained in business continuity planning so that they can start up their businesses in the event of an emergency. This initiative is aimed at strengthening the capacity of MSMEs in the area of disaster risk reduction and contingency planning in Jamaica. To touch on an interesting point, sometimes a sore point, the Disaster Risk Management Act speaks to guide the legal evacuation of persons identified to be at risk. So I want to remind us that the Disaster Risk Management Act of 2015, which seeks to strengthen Jamaica's existing disaster preparedness and emergency management capacity, was passed in the House of Parliament on Tuesday, October 7, 2014, and gazetted in February 2015. The decision by Cabinet to repeal the Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management Act of 1993 is significant and is actualizing the deliverables under the Jamaica National Development Plan, Vision 2030, and deliverables in, the, in accordance with International Disaster Risk Management Treaties and a framework for action. So one of the objectives on the DRM Act of 2015 is to guide the legal evacuation of persons identified to be at risk. Today I wish to focus our attention on the legal evacuation of persons identified to be at risk and to state that when an evacuation order is issued, it is issued by the Prime Minister in consultation with the Minister with Responsibility for Disaster Management and the Director General in the OTPAM. The evacuation order is issued when danger is imminent and conditions exist that seriously endanger people's lives in a defined area. When the order is issued, persons are strongly urged to relocate to a safe area. In this instance, an individual's personal discretion should not be a deciding factor. A person who refuses to comply with an evacuation order shall be fined under the DRM Act Part 10, subsection uh, 52B, which states that every person who without reasonable excuse fails to comply with the direction given or requirement imposed by an authorized office under tw section 27 commits an offense and shall be liable on summary conviction before the resident magistrate to a fine not exceeding a million dollars or imprisonment of terms not exceeding 12 months. Ladies and gentlemen, when an evacuation order is issued, we encourage you, heed the warning from the OTPEM. Do not become too preoccupied with your personal assets and your possessions that you put your lives and your family's lives at risk. When the evacuation order is issued, we ask that you move quickly. There must be no delay. So when we say move, you move. I'll repeat for you. When we say move, you move. In 2020, the OTPEM will be launching a public information and education campaign that will further highlight the relevant sections of the Disaster Risk Management Act for public safety. Over the holidays, we'll be collaborating with the Jamaica Fire Brigade in their efforts to raise awareness and reduce the risk of fires during the festive season. Additionally, we'll be partnering with the Minister of Health and Wellness as they remind the Jamaican people about personal responsibility in destroying mosquito breeding sites around their homes and businesses. In closing, the OTPEM reaffirms its commitment to reducing the impact of disasters occurring in Jamaica, but we cannot do this without your cooperation and willingness to take personal responsibility for your safety. Remember, disaster management is everybody's business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. White. 
I want to at this time specially welcome Senator Pernell Charles Jr., Minister with our portfolio in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. And I want to invite him to bring brief remarks. Welcome, Senator. Thank you, and I note your emphasis on brief remarks. Let me firstly, of course, um, acknowledge and thank my colleague, Minister, the Honorable Desmond McKenzie, Minister of Local Government, Community Development, and all other things. Um, and of course, Permanent Secretary and all of the distinguished representatives and guests that are here. Um, I just want to acknowledge the government's thrust towards having a cohesive and coherent approach to our development. Uh, when I was asked by the Prime Minister to serve in this capacity in Cabinet with a focus on water and housing, uh, one of the first persons who I spoke to uh, smartly is the Honorable Desmond McKenzie. And his advice at that time was to ensure that as I step forward through activities, that I never forget the rural communities, and that I never forget to partner with the important ministries. He was sending me a message, a message that I, that I received, and a message that has been um, really reaffirmed in the need for us to go forward to advance the solutions for water in Jamaica in a way that is coordinated. So the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation um, requires the support of all ministries, but in particular, this local government ministry is the ministry that reaches throughout Jamaica, throughout the communities. The municipal corporations, we've taken the time to meet with you um, and to hear your challenges and concerns. And now, this morning was the first um, official meeting with Minister and his team where we really had a chance to sit down, to examine and dissect some of the issues and come up uh, with some of the joint activities that we'll be advancing for 2020. Again, I want to say thanks to Minister and PS for really accepting the invitation, and not only accepting it, but before I could say anything in the meeting, Minister already presented what was clearly an agenda that would allow for us at the ministry to work with local government. And I know that we've been working together already in terms of discussions on how we're going to procure trucks to treat with the drought management. And now we're moving to ensure that the water shops that are built by local government are going to be consistent in a general and more comprehensive approach with the wayside tanks that we're doing at the ministry. We'll also be working together to make sure that the minor systems across the country that our rural water supply limited um, is operating and executing are done in conjunction with the several water shops that the local government ministry um, is now finishing some I think it's five that have been completed and another six another six that you have five or six that you have to complete oh, the the brief MC and general message that we are sending is that this is one government and we realize that the ministries that directly touch and concern water, such as local government, are ministries which we have to work with hand in hand if we're going to achieve what we have in our national water sector policy, which is universal access to all Jamaica, not just urban, not just Kingston, not just Montego Bay PS, but across our country. We cannot achieve this without the municipal corporations. We cannot achieve this without uh, the support and directive of the Honorable Desmond McKenzie. And so I take the time, I've come to say thank you firstly again to the local government ministry for being attentive, responsive. And again, I'm so pleased with what I've already heard in terms of what you're already doing in, in terms of the mapping of the minor water systems and the work you're doing to get water across to the communities where there is no pipe no utility service. So we need you, and we want to reach out to all of the, the mayors, the administrators of the municipal corporations, agencies of local government ministry, and say to you that we have an open system. 
partnership is required. We need your, we need your, your intelligence, we need your communication and your network to reach across Jamaica. Um, we look forward to the initiatives for next year. Uh, I know that the minister will be a hard taskmaster in terms of setting the timelines, but that is one of the reasons, Minister, why we have chosen my team, CTD and others, to start with the Ministry of Local Government. Because we know that if Desmond McKenzie said it must be done, it will be done. So, again, um, to Jamaica, uh, we also require your partnership. The Ministry of Local Government will be identifying a representative. Hopefully, the minister will be able himself to also come. That will sit on the Integrated Water Resource Management Council. We have a brilliant young lady from the Local Government Ministry already now as part of the preliminary team that is establishing the council. Um, and that body is going to be the premier standard bearer body to advise the minister and for us to give information to cabinet on all things relating to this integrated water resource management approach. So in everything, it is partnership towards building resilience and towards us creating the kind of water sector that is needed for us to withstand the impacts of climate change. Minister, again, thank you very much. Yes, we, I, I'll close by just mentioning one more thing. A subcommittee of that council, very important subcommittee, will be the Drought Management Committee. Um, Jamaica, you'll be pleased to know that we are not waiting until the drought, Robert, for us to treat with the drought. Uh, Mayor Williams and myself in Senate have discussions about trucking. We don't like trucking, but we know that trucking is the most practical short-term method. So together with the local government ministry, for us to have a more, as a country, as a nation, we have to be prepared for the worst. Um, the utility, utility services through NWC were part of our meeting today, and we will be working with NWC to make sure that we fix the ferry pipeline um, and that we fix the areas in Constant Spring Springs and other areas in the utility service. But this Drought Management Committee Minister will be critical, critical to our process of preparing and executing next year. So we look forward to that. Again, thank you very much. I will take up no more time. All right, I think I've been brief. That was only two minutes. Uh, thank you very much to the Minister, PS, and the Minister of Local Government. Thank you very much, Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard a variety of presentations from experts within the core ministry, the local authorities, members of the political directorate at the local level. And so now it is my pleasure to call on the person who, as being the man responsible for policy, is ultimately responsible for all these programs and initiatives that you have heard of today. Please help me to welcome the Honorable Minister Desmond McKenzie to address you. Thank you very much, Oliver. Colleague Minister Pernell Charles, Jr. And I want to thank Pernell for coming. I extended the invitation while we are at the meeting this morning, and he indicated his willingness to, to be here. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Local Government, Mayor Williams, Mayor Scott had just left, um, Dennis Chung from the <coughs> National Solid Waste Management Authority, uh, Commission of the Fire Brigade, the SDC, Dr. Vernon, uh, Ms. Streaker Lewis, head of the Board of Supervision, and you heard earlier on from Mr. Audley Gordon. Let me just uh, make some brief comments on the brief statement made by Minister Charles. I did indicate some time ago that there was a meeting pending between 
the Ministry of Local Government and the Ministry of Water as it relates to the water crisis in the country. The local authorities have responsibility for minor water supply and the National Water Commission falls under the direct control of Minister Charles. We both share the same concerns about the state of water supply in the country and the announcement that he just made about the integrated uh, committee and the drought committee are two components of which the Ministry of Local Government is fully on board and I am glad to hear that they are going to take the design of our water shops as a means of extending water to communities across the country, which will never have the luxury of having piped water from the National Water Commission. We are convinced and comfortable in the direction in which the government is looking towards solving the water crisis as best as possible. There are going to be some areas across the country that we will not be able to get water out of the NWC uh, pipeline. But every attempt will be made by this administration, we will still continue to provide the requisite resources to ensure that we respond to the call. We committed to secure water trucks for all the municipal corporations across the country. So far, St. Mary is well advanced down the wicket in purchasing brand new water truck and arising out of the meetings this morning we are going to be coordinating with the Ministry of Water to have one standard uh, sets of water trucks across the country so Minister Charles thank you so much I must also tell you that your father once sat in the chair that I am now sitting and he also sat in the chair that you are sitting as minister with responsibility for water. So thank you very much. Um, yes, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the <clears throat> Ministry of Local Government have experienced a good year in 2019. It has been a year where we have achieved a lot as it relates to the various policies that has been initiated by the government. And I want to start off with the National Solid Waste Management Authority. And we can't talk about the success of that organization too much. We're talking about an entity three and a half years ago that very few people in this country had any regards for. There was no respect for the entity. It lacked leadership. It lacked credibility. And it lacked the kind of input that requires that was required to deal with the various issues surrounding garbage collections in the country. I am not saying to the country today that we are where we want to in terms of the National Solid Waste Management Authority, but it is fair to say 
that we are in a much, much better place than we were three and a half years ago. The organization has improved in such a way that for the first time in the establishment of the organization, when it was set up by the most honorable Edward Siaga in the 80s, it is the first time in the history of the organization that they have been able to fulfill all their requirements that is stipulated under the law by having up-to-date audited statements and then for me to be able to table in the parliament a report that has been long overdue for one decade. And I think that is a tremendous achievement. Chairman Chung spoke about the efforts that was put in. And again, I want to, to commend him and to thank him on behalf of the government for this, the leadership that he, uh, that he has been giving to the National Solid Waste Management Authority as its chairman. We have seen the quality of the service improving leaps and bounds. And Dennis, I just want to thank you and the board for the tremendous job that you continue to do. Audley Gordon has brought a different flair to the position of MD. And I figure because of his long years of association working with me, at least something good as was handed down to. But I want to say to you, as politicians, we make decisions that at times have serious consequences. And when the recommendation was made to consider Mr. Gordon for the position, many questions were asked. And as the minister with responsibility, I kept out of the, the frame. I allowed the board which had the authority to conduct. And I can say to the board, the country is better off today for the decision that you took in appointing Audley Garden to head the National Solid Waste Management Authority. We have seen the improvements. The workers are properly decked out in their uniform. You can identify them. New trucks roaming across the country. Getting environmental permits for at least three of our landfill that never ex we never had that before. And while we still continue to grapple with certain other issues surrounding its operation, I am confident that the leadership that is there, that the foundation that has been established will eventually take us to that place where we want to go in terms of garbage collection in this country. Since 2016, and it is worthy of note that the government of Jamaica, since 2016, have spent more than a billion dollars providing trucks and various equipments to the National Solid Waste Management Authority. Never happened before. Never happened before since 2016. And I can say the same about the Jamaica Fire Brigade. We have placed the Jamaica Fire Brigade at the top of the list. And over the years, the brigade 
again, lack the kind of support that was required to make it work. And since 2016, we have provided more trucks to the Jamaica Fire Brigade and other equipment that have been provided to them in the last 20 years since 2016, we have provided those resources to the Jamaica Fire Brigade. We have gone even a step further. I listened to the commissioner when he spoke at the opening of the fire station in Montego Bay. And he said that he is in the job now over 20 odd years. And in that period, he has never witnessed the construction of one fire station. But in his first three months as commissioner, he has witnessed the signing and the opening and the construction of four fire stations in a short period of time. So we have done all the things, ladies and gentlemen, that is necessary to give the Jamaica Fire Brigade the support that is needed. In this year's budget, we have provided a significant amount of funding for training. Because training is very, very important to the Jamaica Fire Brigade. We have provided them with the basic tools that are required to fight fire. We have invested a significant amount of money in upgrading fire stations across the country. We are expected in the new financial year to roll out and, and commence the construction on a brand new facility in Maypen in Clarendon. Discussions are well advanced to create two more fire stations, one in rural Jamaica and one in the corporate area. Papinas been an area that has been looked at for years as it relates to the location of a new fire station. Those discussions are well advanced. The commissioner only this week has been engaged in discussions on a location in Papi. And the commissioner will be going to Trelawney along with the Member of Parliament for South Trelawney to look at locations in that part of Jamaica for the establishment of a new fire station. Because based on the survey that was conducted by the brigade and the constant demand and complaint from residents, especially in that section of Trelawney, there is definitely a need for such facility. And again, Commissioner, I want to thank you on behalf of the government to thank you and the men and women of the Jamaica Fire Brigade for the tremendous work that you have been doing despite the limitations. And I encourage you to continue to work in the best interest of the country. The Social Development Commission is another major entity of this ministry. It is the body that deals with the community and social programs of the government. The SDC is headed by a young, vibrant leader, Dr. Duane Vernon, who is in the audience here, along with the Deputy Executive Director and other members of the team. And we rely heavily on the SDC for data. And some of those data have helped us to make far-reaching decisions. But outside of just collecting 
data, the SDC continue to contribute strongly to effective community development. And this year, the SDC has helped to develop 418 new areas of opportunities, creating employment, over some 2,000 young Jamaicans have benefited from social programs, grant assistance operated through the Social Development Commission. I don't know why you give them a big hand because the name of the ministry is the Ministry of Local Government and Community Development. And in the new financial year, we'll be rolling out a comprehensive program of reviving community centers across Jamaica. And that is a major part of the focus of the SDC next year. Chairman Vernon and Deputy Fritz, again, I want to thank you on behalf of the government for a fantastic job. Continue to do what you are doing to help the youths across the various communities in Jamaica. There is one element of the ministry that I have a real sense of pride in. And that is a area that deals with our social basket and it is headed by a young woman who I want her to stand so if you don't know her you can have a look at the head the secretary of the board of supervision very young Trika Lewis we have seen manifesting itself a program throughout our infirmaries that we have never witnessed before in this country. Never before. In this financial year alone, this administration has spent over $700 million on infrastructure development and putting in equipment in our infirmaries across the country. Never happened before. Some of what we have been able to do in this financial year, all our infirmaries have received standby generators. So no longer when there's an outage, they have to be using candles and tinning lamp to find their way back home. All that will, is required is for the automatic switch to chip in and the generator will have light for as long as the power outage. Never happened before. We have put in autoclave machines. What is an autoclave machine? The infirmaries used to operate when there is a cut. Can't dress the cut properly because they don't have the requisite uh, equipment to do so. Through the Ministry of Health, the, the, the Health Fund, we were able to provide all 13 infirmaries across the country with a brand new autoclave machine. They are up and working to the benefit of the residents who reside in our infirmaries. We have provided washing machines, dryers of an industrial nature so that the clothes that they wear, they can wash them and dry them in good style. Never before have our infirmaries received anything of this nature. Closed circuit television, not just 
for the comfort of the staff to see what is happening on the inside, but on the outside to give security and protection to our residents. We are concluding the build out of our drop in facilities. All our drop in facilities have been fully furnished, staffed, being supplied on a monthly basis. None of our drop in facilities will ever find itself in a position where it cannot provide for persons who are living on the streets, who want something to eat. All our facilities, ladies and gentlemen, has been established in a way that those who come to us for assistance will never be turned back. Only a couple of weeks ago, we broke ground for a modern facility to be built at a cost of $140 million at the top of King Street that will house persons living on the streets of the corporate area. Kingston and St. Andrew account for the greatest portion of street people in this country. Of the over 2,000, more than 70% live on the streets in the corporate area. And I can tell you about it because half of them is in my constituency, the downtown area of Kingston. That is where we find this high concentration of persons living on the streets. This is an overview of the ministry's performance, but I don't have the time to go through it because there's so much to say about the success of the ministry of local government. During this period that we are now in the Christmas period, the Ministry of Local Government through the 14 municipal cooperations is providing over 120,000 job opportunities between now and Christmas. Over 120,000 job opportunities. We are also providing, during this period, the support that is required, and a lot was said by Mayor Williams on the nice abatement act, but just to, to advise you, Mayor, that in discussions at a different place yesterday, a meeting very shortly, perhaps before the end of this week, will be convened to have further discussions on the question of the nice abatement and to where we go and to how we treat it. I think this is something that is important, something that we need to, to look at because it is in the best interests of the country. The ministry, in regards to our social programs, again, one of the great achievements of the Ministry of Local Government has been our Youth Summer Employment Program. This program, since it was started in 2017, I've seen over where some 12,000 young people during the summer was employed under this program. 12,000. And one of the good things about it is that out of that batch of 12,000, we have retained over 600 of them that have been gainfully employed in our municipalities across the country. We have also looked at about 230 of these young persons and we are now placing them through the Artrust NTA for certification because there is a demand for local government for certain kinds of skills that we are not able
to keep when we get them because of the salaries, but we are now making the way possible by training these persons, providing scholarships. We are providing six scholarships for a total of eight million dollars that will see persons getting training in the field of to be an architect, um, draftsman, technical competence. These are skills that are required in the ministry of local government and we are training these persons for the benefit of local government. And so this is actually our first quarterly press briefing coming at the, the end of the year. And I think it is a it is important that we highlight the success of the Ministry of Local Government. I end my presentation on a note which is of importance. Jamaica next year will be hosting the seventh regional platform on disaster risk management. It is the first time that a conference of that nature will be held outside of the Americas. It is the first time that the conference will be held in a country as small as Jamaica. We are the first country to be given that honor. It is a United Nations conference. We are expecting some 1,500 delegates from at least 35 or 50 countries within Latin America and the Caribbean, and we are expecting an additional 15 countries outside of the region to attend that conference in Montego Bay during the period of July 7th to July 12th. One of the features of that conference is that we are introducing for the first time a youth forum of the risk, disaster risk conference. They have never had it before. And we have placed that on the agenda to be one of the improvements that we are making to a United Nations conference. <laughs> Jamaica will be on show. When I spoke in Montego Bay, at the call for volunteers, I mentioned what are the expectations of persons who would like to work as volunteers. Some people took me to task for saying so, and some supported me. But I want to make this point, ladies and gentlemen, that what we are going to be doing is not a conference where you represent yourself. It is a conference where you are representing your country, Jamaica, and you must put your best foot forward to show what Jamaica is all about. It is not what, what you are about in terms of your looks. It is what the country is all about. And I maintain my position that we will take those persons who we consider to be acceptable to be ambassadors of the country. If Tony and Singh was not good ambassador, we couldn't be singing our praises here today. And it is time that this country move away from mediocrity and accept the fact that this is a country that is evolving and we must move with the times and we must allow people to feel proud to be called Jamaicans at all times. 
And so I want to thank all of those persons who have worked with the ministry. The permanent secretary, give her a big hand. And the senior managers of the Ministry of Local Government. We have had some testing times. But you know, sometimes you finger have to burn if you love rose card. And there's not that comes without a little shake up. But I have had the privilege of working with a team of professional public servants who I am proud to be their minister. And I am sure that they are proud to call me their minister. And to the wider family of the ministry, National Solid Waste Management Authority, the Social Development Commission, the Jamaica Fire Brigade, the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Management, which you uh, was eloquently represented here by Delmaris White in her presentation, and Ms. Trika Lewis from the Board of Supervision. This is the team that have made the Ministry of Local Government strong and will make it even stronger, working closely along with the 14 municipal corporations across the country. This is a brief report on the stewardship of the Ministry of Local Government. I thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for what, while you call it brief, is most certainly a comprehensive overview of the activities of the Ministry and what will come shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, of our colleagues in the media, I now invite you to raise any questions that may have occurred while you heard all the various presentations. What, can, can, you just, can you just raise your voice a bit? No. Afternoon, Alyssa Willis from The Observer. Just wanted to know as it relates to the concerns that were raised about places of amusement that are not properly outfitted, uh, what's going to be done? I know that's a long-standing campaign by the minister in his um, role as mayor back then. Um, it seems, seems to be reoccurring. So what will be done about those entities that refuse to come up to standard? All right. I, I, I did not touch that because the fire chief did speak on it but in a subsequent meeting that we had or a meeting prior to this we are now looking at that comprehensive list and shortly those entities that are operating without the requisite license and permits we will be publishing those names in the daily paper so that the public can be, can be so advised and then the necessary notices will be served on those entities. So those are some of the steps that we will be taking. Uh, Minister, Prince Moore from RGR. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned about uh, 120,000 jobs to be created. Could you elaborate some more on it in terms of what kind of jobs and which areas? 100, when I speak about that 120 jobs, I said during this period, and it is based on the Christmas work program that the various municipalities across the country is undertaking. So when you average a municipality um, employing six, 8,000 persons right across the municipality because each councillor has an allocation where he or she employs X amount of persons. And when you tally that amount, it is probably even more, but I put that at a rough 
number, but it is employment that it is on a short term basis. So it is not employment that is that is consistent, but it is employment on a short term basis. Can be because in in, in in some cases some of the municipalities would find other funding to undertake some projects uh, that would not fall within uh, the knowledge that I know of, but I am pretty sure that the number is accurate in terms of the amount of persons that is being employed on a part-time basis over the holidays. If I yes, might, you're following up. Go ahead, please. If, if I might pose one to Mayor Williams. Mayor Williams, um, on the matter of entertainment events, how does the KCMC plan to deal with uh, entertainment events without the requisite permits? And also, on the matter of entertainment events um, being erected illegally, is there a plan to deal with that particularly in terms of signage oh. for entertainment events? Well, the, the law is very clear on that. So no, an, an event that is not approved is not supposed to, to go ahead. And the police is, is clear on that, and the municipality is clear on that. But we do know some of them get away because we can't police every single, every, every place at the same time. But I believe there is vigilance on the part of the police and ourselves and the, the various stations, I mean, stretched across the country, they are quite aware of this. And I, I believe that the JCF is very active in terms of, of checking on the, at these events and ensuring that they have the necessary license. But to answer, they are not supposed to go ahead once they, are, they don't have the requisite permits. And the same, the same with the signage. But we have been, we, the, over the last week, we have we have been going around and taking down a lot of the signs that have not been approved. So. Yeah. I omitted to, to say something which I think is of also importance. The problem we're facing with the dengue outbreak is a real concern. On the 27th of this month, the day following Boxing Day, there'll be a meeting here with all the mayors, the CEOs, the Ministry of Health, Fire, and a number of persons to look at the new program that we'll be rolling out to deal with this dengue outbreak that is taking place. It is something that is of concern and it is something that we are taking very seriously and out of this meeting is going to be a more expansive joint operation between the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Local Government. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? I know that a treasure trove of information has been provided. So in the classic sense of the trade, I will say going once, going twice, and I believe you have been sold on the work and worth of the Ministry of Local Government over the last 12 months. And we want to give you the assurance that despite the challenges and despite what has already been achieved, the best is yet to come. I thank you very much for your kind attention and have a very, very good afternoon.
This is Iroy. Iroy is a born Jamaican. Wagwan! Iroy and the other Jamaican iguanas live in the Helsha Hills Forest in St. Catherine, Jamaica. Jamaican iguanas live in Jamaica and nowhere else in the world. Big up, me crew! Iroy and his friends eat fruit, flowers,